Hello, hello, good evening everyone, good evening and welcome. So, here we are once again, ready to get started on a new week. This one is going to be a little bit of a weird one because, well, we're going to start today on a Tuesday and we're going to wrap it up on a Friday. But, you know, it is what it is. This month is going to be a little bit special because next week is also going to be like that. We're going to have um, a little bit of a switch in the days that we're going to be working but yeah, you know, the important thing is that we get to practice and that we get to learn more English. So for tonight, we are going to be covering um, something special and uh, we're going to be um, talking about gerunds, which is a topic that, uh, um, as I have mentioned before, is not necessarily um, easy to understand. It's not something that is used in Spanish, but at the same time, it is very, very very useful in English. So we're going to be working on that. And uh, well, also, we're going to be talking about how to get something done. And we might be also touching base with three word, um, the three word phrasal verbs. We already know that phrasal verbs are verbs that are, you know, like compound verbs, verbs that um, are not expressed with only one word. In Spanish, we don't have that because you know that our language is very, very, very large. And uh, whenever we just have like a new word or a new activity, um, normally what we do is that we go ahead and uh, like come up with a new word. That's like, that's the regular for Spanish. In English, they don't do that, okay? In English, normally what they do is that, um, they just add like a preposition after the verb and that becomes a new action. So that's something very common in English. You see it in many common activities. Like for example, when you talk about working out, that is something so common and that so many people practice, but there is not necessarily a, a word that is used specifically for that activity. When you work out, um, you cannot simply say that you're exercising because exercising has to be uh, or has to do with something um, different or with a different activity. So, you know, English is a little bit weird in that sense. And uh, phrasal verbs are, are not only compound by two words. We also have some that are compound by three words. And those are some of the verbs that we're going to be looking at tonight. Um, so, yeah, hopefully you guys are ready. Hopefully you had an amazing weekend, you know, on, on this um, short break that we had. It was a four day weekend, basically. But we're back. We're back at it again. And uh, yeah. So for tonight, I wanted to go ahead and uh, ask you the question once again, because, well, you know, in the last class, you guys had the chance to um, to talk with one another. Uh, so, yeah, for tonight, I think that uh, we're going to go back to the basics and we're going to get to talk about, um, well, about the weekends. OK, so. How was the weekend? Basically, that's going to be it. It's not going to be too long. We're not going to be spending too, too much time on it today. Um, but yeah, so let's see and uh, let's get started with it because I think there is a lot to cover tonight. And as I was mentioning, something that I will love to get to is um, discussing the three word phrase verbs. As, as I said, they are, uh, you know, crucial parts of the English language. And they help us to express, um, well, activities or things that without them, it will be very difficult to talk about. But now, let's see. Um, we're going to have um, Noemi for starters. So tell us, Noemi, how was your weekend? Hi, teacher. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, in the weekend? Mm-hmm. Uh, in I I was in my house. Uh, no, no, Sally. No highlights. No special activities. No, 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 no. In All my right. house. Okay, that's nice. But very know. hot in my house. Okay, nice. No activity. Very good. Nice, nice, nice. So yeah, you got to enjoy your time at your house. And also, I will assume that um, you also got to rest. So that's great. Yes. You know, 
you had some time to just stay home and relax. Yes, yes. Very nice. Good, good, good. All right. Thanks. Let's see. You're very welcome. Let's see if we can get to hear from Eraivin. How about you, Eraivin? How was your weekend? Hi, teacher. Hey there. It, uh, it has been a very good weekend. Mm -hmm. I went with some friends to, to like chill out. I don't know how to say it. Mm -hmm. You're well, we right? went. Huh, we went to walk, uh, to talk a little bit, to eat something. Uh, we ate pupusas. We went and worked a lot. We talked uh, about a lot of things. And I think it has been a, a very good weekend, teacher. All right. Very nice. That is great. You know, having um, some time to spend with, um, with friends and... Uh, also getting to talk about the things that has have happened in a specific time. We have a word for that. When we are, you know, having a conversation that goes about the last events in, you know, a group of people's life, we talk or we refer to this as catching up. So basically what you did this weekend is that you did some catching up with your friends. That means that, you know, you had conversations about different things. And you are, um, you know, talking about the, the things that have happened. So basically that's, we do that when uh, we get together, mostly when we have more than two people. Okay. When we have like three people and more, that will be catching up because you're having like a conversation with, um, with different people and talking about the different things that have happened in uh, each other's lives. So yeah, basically that's part of what you did for the weekend. Okay, thank you, teacher. All right, you're very welcome. Also, um, Nadia, I'll be back with you in a, in a second. Uh, chill out is okay, all right? When you are, like, just having fun with friends, you can say, you know, you can refer to that as chilling out. Uh, so that is okay. Then you can also say hang out, okay? So both of those are useful to refer to activities like that, you know, to um, when you... Just to spend time with people, um, not doing anything specific, not carrying out any specific activity, just being there, you know, doing whatever comes up. Like you say you go to the park, but then you end up having pupusas, as you said. So many things come up. That's basically just hanging out or chilling out. Both are useful in, the, um, in that aspect. Okay, Nadia, your question. Um. I I I shared with you about my weekend. Okay, cool. Too. Great. Tell me then, how was your weekend? Um, uh, in my case, uh, I have a good weekend too, uh, but I am practice for the first time uh, mm -hmm. Tai Chi. Tai Chi it, it's a, a great exercise and I enjoy in this activity. E and I eat pupusas too. All right. Very good. Yeah. Great. Great. Very nice. That is nice. You know, trying new things, getting to experience um, new stuff in life. That is basically what it's all about. Um, trying to get to do something different, getting out of the routine. So very good. I am very glad that you got to do that. You got to experience um, such an activity and also, well, that you had some pupusas because, well, what kind of Salvadorian will we, would, would we be if we didn't like pupusas? All right. Let's see now if we get to hear from Jenny. How about you, Jenny? How was your weekend? Good evening. Good evening. My, my weekend, I went to the beach with my friend, my sister oh, and my daughter. Great. All right, yes. so only women's? Yes, only women's. <laughs> All right, that's and nice. We, we went to the Veranera speech mm -hmm. and uh, we danced well, dance <laughs> uh, uh, at night. All right. We, no, so the vision at night. <laughs> all right so that sounds like it was a nice activity you know and only women 
<laughs> yeah, and only women night. I mean, it's nice. It's fun. I will assume. So very good. That is nice. You got to you know to spend some time with your sisters and your daughter. So yes. who wouldn't like something like that? Spending time with family is always very important. So very good. Great. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. Thank you very much for sharing. All right. Okay. How about the case of you, Dennis? How was your weekend? Well, good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, uh, Saturday, I was in a workshop uh, with a social organization in Cotepeque City. Mm. Uh, Sunday and yesterday, I stay at home uh, all day, and and I've been playing the piano. Oh, great! Very good. Nice, nice, nice. You know, spending time at home and also um, polishing your skills is very advisable. So, if you like playing the piano and you had some time, some time off, um, of course, it is going to be a great idea. You know, to go ahead and and play the piano for a little bit. So, great, very, very nice. Um, Alrighty then, let's see if we can now can hear from two more people. One of those is going to be Daisy. How about you, Daisy? How was your weekend? Okay. Hello? Hello. Okay. Uh, I was at home. Mm doing a lot of tax returns online. A lot Only. of what, sorry? A lot of tax returns online. Oh, tax returns. Yeah, because this weekend was basically the closing, right? The closing weekend. Today is the final day. Yeah, and uh, when do they pay back? <laughs> That's the thing that I care about. Eighteen dollars for. Oh. Okay, great, great, very good. So, um, that is not nice necessarily because it is work and you had to be working. But still, you know, uh, work can be fun sometimes. And uh, it sounds like uh, doing such an activity can be also refreshing. I think in my case, I I only have to do my own tax return. I. I like it when I have it, you know, sometimes it's like I am expecting it now as I know how to do it and I, I have learned. Um, but I can also assume that doing tax returns for more people can also be tricky because people are not always honest with their money and the things they do. So I think it's it's something very tricky to deal with. But anyway, you did it and that's great. Very nice. All right. So the last person for tonight is going to be Alejandro. Tell us, Alejandro, how about you? How was your weekend? Hello, teacher. Uh, Hello <laughs> uh, my, my weekend was uh, very nice. It was very busy. Uh -huh. So I helped to my ex mother in law to, uh, to drive her car because mm -hmm. she, she, can, she can't drive. Mm -hmm. And she needs uh, a couple of papers, you know, a couple of uh, uh, shopping, shopping something for mm -hmm. her house mm -hmm. uh, because she's uh, uh, she's um, make covering her house. Mm -hmm. Is correct? Make covering, yes. Yes, make covering her house. So uh, she she had. To to buy to buy uh, um, some materials. To, to the, All right. To the cars. I don't know. To, to mm -hmm. the some decor. Yeah, some decoring. So I I I don't know how can I say the company. And uh, I drove her car. Yeah. Join her and drove her car. I, you already said that. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it. Oh, okay. So it sounds like a very active weekend. Did you go to many um to many workshop stores? Excuse me again. Did you go to many stores, or was it only at one store? Not maybe um four four uh, 
um, materials hardware store. hardware stores uh, hardware stores yes for for hardware store in in total wow yeah because we have to we have to see the toilet and ceramic I don't know how you can say ceramic um, okay. now that things about that yeah. All right. Very yeah. good. Yeah, that sounds like a fun activity. I mean, in my case, because I love going to hardware stores whenever I have a chance. Uh, even there is a joke with me and my girlfriend that I tell her that when you know we finally live together in the future, um, if I ever get lost on a Sunday, if she ever looks gets to lose track of me and see where I am on a Sunday, it is very very possible that I might be found at an EPA or a Vidri or something like that exactly. because I enjoy spending time there so much. Um, I almost yeah. never buy anything, but I like to go and see, you know, the things that they have and think about when I would like to buy something to decor my own house. So yeah, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's fun. I mean, in my opinion, it's it's relatively fun to go ahead and yes. do shopping on. <laughs> Hardware stores. Okay, yeah, now the only thing, la única cosita, el único detalle, pues es para todos, verdad? No solo para usted, sino para todos. Eh, por ejemplo, cuando decimos eso de, al principio usted dijo que tenía que hacer varias cosas. Um, you can use the, the the phrase run some errands or run errands. Okay, so run, run some errands. Eh, básicamente se refiere a hacer mandados. Cuando hablamos acerca oh, okay. de hacer los man, de hacer mandados, um. Y así no somos, no estamos especificando qué, sino que we oh. only say run some errands. As when we in Spanish say, um, I'm going to go, go do some mandados, it means that maybe we're going to pay some bills. Maybe we're going to get, I don't know, medicine from a pharmacy. Maybe we're going to go, um, who knows, to check something in our car. So running errands, doing different things, that refers to running errands. So, yeah. All right, then. Very good. Yeah, you're very welcome. Sounds like it was a very fun activity for you. All right. So, Dennis, tell me. Uh, only question, how do you write errands? I already sent it in the chat. It's E-R-R, -R, or sorry, E-R-R, um, A-N-D-S. Mm -hmm. All right, then. Um, so let's see if we can get to move on right now. And uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about this and talk about have or get something done. Now, to do that, we're going to have to use gerunds normally. That's the way to go about talking, um, you know, getting something done. Here we have some examples that will help us understand how we're going to be using by plus the gerund to describe how to do something or how to do things. The first example that we have will read something like the following. You could improve your accent by listening to language CDs. So here, what we do is basically that uh, we mention, of course, the activity or um, the thing that is expected to be done or what you are um, expected to be done or what you could do. And then when you use by, you introduce the activity. Okay. So when we use by, basically we mention um, the activity or in this case, we're going to be more specific, the verb that will help us. And afterwards, we also have to mention um, the noun or the activity itself that will be the one that will uh, end up, you know, giving us the benefit. So we have, you could improve your accent by listening to language CD or CDs. The next example is, I learn new words best. I learn new words best by writing them on pieces of paper and sticking them on things. If you guys remember, this was part of one of the conversations we were practicing last week. Um, so yeah. I learn new words best by writing them on pieces of paper and sticking them on things. So here, something we have to consider is that um, the verbs that are part of, well, the activities that we are going to be carrying out are going to be written in its participle form or as we refer to them in English, in its gerund form. Sí, importantísimo, que siempre que utilicemos el by para referirnos a ese tipo de actividades, básicamente es cuando estemos hablando, ¿verdad? De, de digamos, 
la acción que nos va a llevar a realizar una actividad, a completar una actividad, eh, cuando utilicemos este tipo de estructuras, vamos a tener que utilizar la forma participio, ¿sí? el presente participio de los verbos. En este caso, cuando hablamos del presente participio en inglés, eh, se forma cuando agregamos el tan famoso ing o ing, ¿verdad? Al final de los verbos. So, we have uh, two different actions here. En esta, en esta actividad o en, esta, en este ejemplo, tenemos dos acciones diferentes. Una sería escribir, ¿verdad? Las palabras, ¿sí? Writing them on pieces of paper. Y luego tenemos sticking them on things, que es una actividad distinta a el simple hecho de escribirlas. También las pego, ¿verdad? Sorry, las puedo pegar en cosas. Like, um, I remember I used to do that. I, it wasn't necessarily for learning. It was more just like, um, how can we refer to this? As a motivational activity. I used to do that often when I was in my internship, when I was living in the U.S. Because, well, I didn't have my family with me. I didn't have my friends with me. So sometimes I will feel lonely and I will write small messages for myself and sticking them maybe on the wall, maybe on the desk. But I will stick, you know, those those messages here and there so that I will remember um, that I was doing that for something. So it's also advisable that you do that when you're talking about learning um, new new words. Now, something, if you guys will ever want to take this advice, something that I will advise you to do as well is to stick um, post-its on or with the title for that object or for the objects. Let's say that in your room, you have a table, you have a desk, you have a TV, you have um, a nightstand, you have a night lamp. What else? You have a phone charger. Um, you have a drawer. What else can we have in a, in a room? Um, you have ceiling, you have walls, you have bricks, you have many things. All right. So if you can start sticking the titles into them and then when you start practicing them, you memorize them, you can unstick them, you know, like take the sticker away, take the post-it away. And uh, it means that you already know the name or the title for that thing. Um, that is something that will help a lot because whenever you're practicing, whenever you want to practice, you will have the name of the thing right in front. And when you consider that you have memorized it, that you have learned it, well, you can simply take away the sticker. And now that means that you know that word. Um, because, well, if we simply start naming things all of, a, I mean, out of the thin air, it is a little bit more complicated because um, we are going to have, we're going to get stuck with some words. And if you already have those words written down, it will be easier because I know that in the beginning, it will simply sound like you're reading, but at the end, you're going to start noticing how you are memorizing the names for all those things that you have in your surroundings. Uh, also, of course, in the beginning, it will look like a, like a madman's house because you're going to have all those stickers all over your, your room. I don't recommend you to do that in your whole house unless, of course, um, you can. But sticking names on things... I bet you that it's going gonna, it's gonna to help you a lot to memorize the names or the titles for those things. So, yeah. But here, the, the one thing that I wanted, I wanted you guys to keep very clear is the fact that we have two different activities. One of them is writing them, and the other one is sticking them. Therefore, these two verbs are going to be in their participle form. Then we have the next example. The best way to learn slang is not by reading newspapers, but by watching movies. So here we are also having mentions of something that is special in English. It's something um, that not too many people know a lot about. In my case, I understand the slang very well. But if you ask me to teach you about it, I think I would struggle because... Um, I mean, some words, of course, are, are easier to understand, but... The thing is with the slang is that if you guys notice or if you have friends from different regions in Latin America or even here in our country, if you have friends from different places, you can notice that people from different groups use different words to refer to the same thing. 
like something that we have in El Salvador is um who says paila and who says wakal. Okay, so that can be seen a little bit as a slang. It's not necessarily slang, but it's you know one one example of a difference that exists um depending on the on the region on how you refer to a special thing. So slang is very common in English. It exists in many different ways, shapes, and forms because um, there is one way of speaking in the northeastern area when we're talking about um, New York, Philadelphia, and the six of those. There is also a difference in the southeastern area where you have Georgia, where you have... Uh, um, Florida. So those states are going to have different ways of referring to the same things. And uh, let's say that one joke that people are going to love in New York is not going to be understood or enjoyed the same way in Florida. Then you also have a different slang in the middle section of the states. And of course, you're going to have way more um, different slang forms in the Western, I mean, in the um yeah, in the Western side, because the West, I think the West is the one that has the most variations um, because you can see that there's where more Latinos live, there's where more Indians live. So, of course, there are going to be big amounts of mixtures in between languages, and that is what gets in the end creating slang. Um, I would like to know, do you guys know any slang words or have ever come across any slang words? ¿Conocen alguna de esas palabras que son conocidas como slang en inglés? ¿O um, nunca han conocido o nunca se han topado con alguna palabra de estas? Ok, Alejandro. Guana is one of them. Yeah. Yeah, guana. Ok. Ok. So, uh, I have some, I have... A, I have... A list here for example when you use um dope okay like uh we're making a plan and at the end of it i say all right dope that means that you're saying something like cool or awesome okay like you agree with the idea i am going to be sending them on the chat so the first one will be that one dope when you say dope it means that you're okay with the idea that you agree with the idea um, for example, another one, this one is very common for people of, uh, you know, for, for black people, the one that is extra. When they say extra, it means that it's something over the top. Like, um, if I simply tell you, like you ask me, how do I look? And I say, oh, you look extra. It means that you look amazing. Okay. So it's basically a way of saying something that is uh, way over the top. It's better than expected. So yeah. Um, this one is another one that is very common when you say fit, um, it's referred to fashion as well. Uh, if, for example, I ask you, I have like a new, what can I say? A new way of dressing. So I ask you, Hey, do you like my fit? It means an outfit. Okay. It means that the clothing that you're using. So that is, that's a slang. All right. So do you like my fit? It's going to mean that if you, if you like what I'm wearing right now. Another another word that is very common is when you say fire. I think that's well known. When you say fire, it means that something looks great. All right. Like, for example, um, what can be something that is fire right now? I don't know if it's a common opinion, but in, for, at least in my circle or in, in you know, for my people, uh, Formula One is fire right now. That means that it's trendy, that it's cool, that people are liking it. Um, but fire is normally used when something is in trend, like when some when something is common and very cool. So that would be fire. Um, then I don't know. Uh, oh yeah. When you use hits, different hits, different. I don't know if you have ever heard this one. Hits different. It hits different. Like, for example, when you're listening to a new song and uh, or let's say that uh, um, you have heard a song. All right. But then you come across the acoustic version of that song. 
and now you feel like the song is better or maybe it's worse. Depending on, on the way of your perception, you can say that it hits different. It's going to mean that it has aspects that um, give you different feelings. Like hits different is going to mean something, um, you know, that it's, for example, um, better or worse, depending on how you feel about the thing. Then we have, this one is a very common slang word as well, low key. When you talk about something, oh, chilling, what's, what's the meaning of chilling? Chilling is algo como relajándonos. Chilling, just chilling, or when you just, you use the word chilling, you refer to something like you're relaxing, you're just, um, you know, just there, resting, not doing anything too special, just doing activities, doing things, but not something that will require a lot of like concentration or something like that. Uh, yes, Eraivin, tell me. Teacher, expressions like come out of the blue could be a slang. That can be considered a slang, but it's more in the region of a um, in an idiom because it's a long phrase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a long phrase. So that's okay. more like an idiom. It will be considered a slang depending on, for example, if it's a phrase that is commonly used in the Western side of the US and is not used in the Eastern side. So that's gonna come okay. you know, as, as an slang. Or if it's okay. um, used more by what? By white people than black people. So that will also um, come as an, as an slang. But- Teacher, um, mm -hmm. for example, blue, I have heard that some American uh, used to say, when when they want to say that they are sad, sad they say they say that they are blue. Blue. Mm -hmm. Could yes. be a slang. That is a slang. Yes, using blue okay. as a replacement for um sadness is a slang. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, when you okay. when you use low key, what you're referring to is basically that um. How can we refer to it? It's like you are the, the feeling or the emotion that you're feeling right now is basically overcoming you. Okay. Like, for example, if you like something, if you're enjoying a video, let's say, um, you can say, I'm low key loving it. So, when you use low key, what you're doing is basically that you're dragging your feet of how much you are enjoying that or how much and the feeling that you're experiencing at that specific moment about um, that thing. So low key is as an exclamation, basically. Dennis. Yes, teacher. Um, I've heard about some phrases uh, like uh, piece of cake, uh, and that means uh, tell a secret. Um, mm -hmm. uh, spill the beans. No, uh, spill the beans means uh, tell a secret. Mm -hmm. And piece of cake it means uh, something is very easy. Very easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those words or those phrases are also more in the region of an idiom. Um, idioms. And I think that for, for the last classes that we're going to have, we're going to be covering them because I always, when we have, you know, those two or, uh, two or one class extra at the end of the, of the lessons, I always like to spend time even talking either about... Um, the phrasal verbs about idioms or practicing something that is useful because I feel like these words and all these phrases are something that not many people get to experience and get to learn and when you get to face them you get confused because as you said um, piece of cake I think nowadays is very common and when you hear that something is piece of cake you of course as you said are referring to something that is easy or relatively easy Spill the beans is like um, when you tell a secret, yes. Or also when someone is stuttering too much. A stutter is when you're doubting, okay? When you're like, um, 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 you, you don't want to start talking. So that uh, pause that you make there makes other people tell you, spill the beans. Come on, go ahead, spill the beans. So basically they're inviting you to talk. Okay, yeah, like, uh, don't hesitate too much. Just go ahead and talk. Um, so, yeah. All right, the next one will be something like when you say that something is salty. 
Okay, salty, normally it would mean that it has a lot of salt. But in, as a slang, when something is salty, it means that it is something bad, let's say. Um, if you feel salty, you yourself, if you use salty to describe your state of being, then you can also mention or refer to uh, it as if you're angry or as if you're um, agitated. So salty can also be used like that. Um, okay, uh, then, oh yeah, then we also have this one, a sleep on. A sleep on. When you t use a sleep on, it basically, or you basically use it when you are, if you use it to say someone or tell someone, don't sleep on the new song or the new movie, that means that you're inviting this person to see the movie or to listen to the song. It means that you don't want them to be ignorant about it. You want them to, you know, to experience it because you feel like it's something special. So sleeping on something means just leaving it aside, not listening to it. So that's sleeping on it. All right. Sleep on something. Then um, what else? Oh, yeah. Sick. When you use the word sick to describe something, when something is sick, it doesn't mean that it's coughing. It doesn't mean that it's ha it has a fever. When something is sick, it means that it's amazing. Depending on what you're describing. If you're describing clothing, it means that the clothing is stylish. If you're describing um, something in the media, like a video or a movie or a song, it means that it's really good. All right. So when you use sick, oh yeah. And sick can also be used in the same way as dope. See, sick and dope se pueden utilizar de formas similares. You can, uh, if you're making a plan with someone and you agreed on a, on a time and a date, then uh, when you have that agreement, you can say, okay, sick. That means that you agree with them. Um, same as with dope. Yes, Dennis? Um, uh, I think I got another one and that is um, terrible or terrific. Yeah, well, for this one, Esta es una palabra bien importante y gracias que la mencionaste porque de hecho es una palabra no muy conocida, ¿sí? Um, down low, down low, down low. Good, yes, that's another slang word right there. Pero primero vamos a, a ver la de, um, la de terrific, ¿sí? ¿Saben qué? Con mi novia, de hecho, hace días... Eh, De hecho, fue para mi grabación, así que fue hace como, ¿qué? Como cinco años, más o menos. Casi me meto en problemas por utilizar esa palabra que acaba de mencionar eh, Dennis, que es terrific. Cuando ustedes utilizan adjetivos para describir principalmente la apariencia de una mujer, creo que iniciamos, ¿verdad?, con adjetivos como cute. Sí, también se puede utilizar que alguien, look, you look fine. Um, then you can say that um, you look beautiful. You look amazing. You look awesome. So you can go farther and farther and farther describing this person. But the word terrific is basically the top of the top. Sí, cuando alguien se ve, o sea, en español sería casi como un, un, un sinónimo de despampanante. O sea, cuando alguien se ve deslumbrante, se ve, o sea, extra, como sería, ¿verdad? El slang word también. Eh, ahí es cuando se va a utilizar la palabra terrific. Ahora, Eso, como les digo, puede ser un problema porque en español terrific se parece mucho, ¿sí? Es una, básicamente ese es uno de los false cognates que existen porque se parece mucho a algo negativo, o sea, a decir que te ves terrible, ¿sí? Entonces se parece, ¿verdad? Y alguien más que todos, o sea, si es una chica y ustedes le dicen, oh, you look terrific, y ella no sabe inglés eh, o no sabe el significado de esta palabra, es muy probable que la hagan sentir mal. Pues como les digo, yo casi me meto en problemas esa vez porque el detalle es que, o sea, mi novia es colochita y ese día ella andaba con el pelo liso, ¿verdad? Y yo cuando la vi, nunca la había visto con el pelo liso, entonces se me hizo como que, wow. Ah, pues y le, dice, le dije, me la acerqué y le dije, no éramos novios todavía, pero le dije, you look terrific. Y ella casi lloró, o sea, porque ella entendió, que ella no sabe inglés, es abogada, entonces ella entendió que le había dicho que sabía terrible. Según ella, yo le había dicho que sabía terrible porque pues yo siempre le había dicho que me encantaba, pues, su pelo rizado, ¿verdad? Así que creyó que eso no me había gustado, que se había, eh, eh, pues, alisado el pelo. 
pero no, o sea, ella no sabía que, que el significado de la palabra terrific, pero sí, sean cuidadosos cuando usen esa palabra, porque terrific um, es especial, o sea, es muy especial, porque pues el significado que guarda, ¿verdad?, es bastante, bastante grande, o sea, si ustedes le dicen terrific a alguien, es como que sí lo sorprendió la forma en la que se ve, también se puede utilizar para describir cosas. You can use terrific for, um, I don't know, a landscape. Let's say that you're, you like climbing and you're like looking at a, at a landscape, at a beautiful landscape, and you can refer or describe that landscape as terrific. Um, but yeah. Now, the download word or the download phrase that um, Gochi has mentioned or sent in the chat is also uh, considered slang. And this one is going to be used to describe something discrete, okay? Like um, something similar to a secret, like an activity that uh, not many people have to know, all right? So that can be also um, a slang, okay? So down law. And uh, then the last one that we're gonna share for tonight is gonna be thirsty. Thirsty, when someone is thirsty in a slang way, it means that, um, This person basically is desiring to have attention. All right. So thirsty is going to refer to someone who wants attention at any cost. And uh, this word has become more and more common nowadays with um, influencers, as of course we know that they are risking to do anything just to bring people's attention to them. So they have that thirst. Sí, o sea, esa, esa sed de atención. So, thirsty can be referred to you, um, you know, to someone or to people who want attention on them. All right. Then, bueno, pasamos de lo del slang a continuar con lo de describing how to do things. Um, so, I hope you guys got the idea on, um, you know, on how we're going to use the verbs when we're describing how to do or how to get things done. Now, we have three different uses for gerunds, or at least for this topic. Um, the first one is to say how something can be done. Okay, so that's the first one. And we have also different examples to them. So to say how something can be done. The example is, you can improve your English by reading a lot. So here, you get the first idea or the um, thing to be improved, then you have the activity or the verb by doing, and then you have what you have to do in order to get to what can be improved. Okay, so this is basically what you have to do. The last section is what you have to do to improve the first thing, the first thing that you mentioned. So you can improve your English by doing a lot of reading. Then we have the second thing, the second use for gerunds. To describe how something was done. Okay, so to describe how something was done. Uh, and here we have, I learned a lot. Sorry, I learned a lot of idioms by watching TV. Okay, so here we have what happened, all right? what happened, then the activity. Here, the, the problem is that um, the verb and the thing that was done are basically the same, okay? Because you did learn, but you did it through this activity, by watching TV. So I learned a lot of idioms by watching TV. Y aquí está lo que les decía. O sea, idioms son un tanto diferentes a slang. Sí, los idioms son frases en cambio slang. Normalmente son o acrónimos o, pues, eh, palabras solas, ¿verdad? Porque, por ejemplo, si ustedes utilizan el OMG, eso es considerado un slang. Um, o qué sé yo, el TBH, eso es bastante común, TBH, o sea, to be honest. Entonces, eso también es un slang. O BRB, sí, be right back. O, ¿cómo sería? Ese es, raro, ese es un poco largo para, para deletrearlo. Um, T T L no T T Y L yeah T T Y L ese es otro T T Y L talk to you later sí sería sí Nadia sorry teacher y uh, the word bestie is this kind of word bestie bestie 
Desti, Desti, Desti. How do you spell that? Besti, the best friend. Bestie. Yeah, okay, Besti. Mm -hmm. This one, Besti. Yeah, when you use Besti, it can also be used as a slang word because um, it's not, you know, the proper way of referring to this um, description. So, yes, a Besti is also a slang word. It will be also considered a slang word. So, here we have these acronyms. Uh, so, these ones are also considered slang. TTYL, talk to you later. TBH, to be honest. OMG, oh my God. Um, so, yeah. We have uh, BRB, as I said, be right back. So these ones are also considered slang. People use them, okay? It's not something that uh, only teenagers use. For example, this one is very common in, in meetings or um, in schools. It's very common that people say BRB. I, have, I heard it a few times and um, yes. Yes, 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 that one as well, Dennis. I L Y. Um, Irving, tell me. Teacher, uh, for example, lol, that is very common. Mm -hmm. Laugh out loud. Laugh out loud. Yes, lol. That's another one. Lol. Laugh out uh, loud. Some of my, some of my friends between girls used to say, "Tell me the tea." They are. It's like, tell me the truth. Mm -hmm. Tell me the tea. Yes. ASAP. That's a very good one, Boris. ASAP. As soon as possible. Now, something very weird that has happened is that in recent times, um, people have stopped using ASAP and have started using this one. Pronto. I don't know why. I think it's because of I mean, how, how many Latinos live in the U.S., but it has become more and more common to say pronto instead of saying um, ASAP. But it is one of those slang, I mean, acronyms that can also be used as a slang. Slangs, guys, are normally those words that are commonly used by people in a specific region, but are not official words to the language. Okay, so slang is basically like a variation of the language that we use for our convenience, but it's not recognized as a word or as a phrase in the language. Um, idioms, in the other hand, are recognized as uh, part of the language, as in the same thing, or yeah, basically they're from the street. Very good. Um, so it's like, for example, refranes and dichos in Spanish, they are not like a bad thing. All right, they're not seen as a disruption of the language, but the way that some teenagers speak, or the way that um, you know that that some people have of speaking, like the codes that you use in a specific groups, those codes are the ones that will be seen as a slang. So in this case, basically, that's what we're referring here, because not everyone is gonna know how or what is the meaning of BRB. Let's say that um, someone has never used it be before and has never heard it before. They're not going to know what B BRB means. Or in the past, when people started using LOL or LOL, it was basically impossible to understand what they meant. Um, nowadays, it's very common. It's common knowledge. OMG is also very common. Um, but back in the day, it was not something common and it was not something that people will understand. Therefore, it became a slang because it was like a code, you know, saying things in short um, so that not everybody will get it. And that is basically the idea behind the slang. Of course, as I said before, now with influencers and all the people that um, are creating content every day, it's like a slang seems like it's part of the code. Pero para ser sincero, lo digo así en español, para las palabras y frases de slang normalmente son utilizadas como para hablar en secreto, en código, y al principio, lo, por, lo, por lo principal que se utilizaban era para criticar. Por eso es que muchas de estas, o sea, tienen, verdad, referencias o sentido hacia la apariencia. Es muy común que las palabras de slang tengan que ver con eso, ¿verdad? Con la apariencia física o al menos eh, la forma en la que, en la que nos, nos presentamos ante los demás. Eh, así que, ajá. 
sorry it's something very very common as i said it's not you know um a weird thing nowadays it's not as magical as it used to be now continuing with this continuing with the uses for the gerunds um we have the third use and it's to describe how something could be done not how something can how something was but how something could be done so this is mostly when we are giving an advice both of them the first one and the, th and the third one um are used as an advice but the first one is more like a proven thing okay like there's proof that you can do this like that okay so the first one is it has more security into it but the third one is more like a thought more like an idea more like a like a like a thing that came to my mind but i'm not sure about it and it's the example that we have is one way of becoming fluent is by talking a lot in class okay one way of becoming fluent is by talking a lot in class it's not the only way but it's one way so it's you know it's a possibility it's something that you could do just to become fluent um as i said before another way of becoming fluent in the language is of course practicing as much as possible so here we have them those are the different ways that you can use to do things now the next one up we have have or get something done of course we're going to continue to that and um, um so here use have or get to describe a service performed for you by someone else so this is something that is done for us by someone else so in the active form when we talk about the uh, like um that someone is going to put their hands or that we're going to mention how someone is putting their hands or nothing we're going to do it like the following do you know where i can have someone fix my bike so here we are talking about a person okay so of course it's going to be something active sorry because what we want to know is about a person or a group or somewhere where someone can do something for us. So that's why it's active, okay? So when we talk about, or when we um, use questions or phrases like this, it is going to be seen as active because we are asking for someone to do something for us. And the examples are the following. You can have Hazel's personal services fix your bike. You can have Hazel's uh, personal services fix your bike so here hazel's personal services is going to have an active participation on the bike fixing so they're gonna do the job they're gonna put their hands on it of course in both are gonna be the same in both cases they're gonna put their hands on it but here the important thing is that hazel's personal services is going to do it okay so that's the important thing see lo importante en este tipo de frases cuando estamos hablando de la voz activa es quien lo hará, ok, y eso es algo que quiero que recuerden, cuando habla, usamos la voz activa es porque esta persona, porque este grupo, porque lo que vamos a, a, el sujeto que vamos a mencionar estará participando pues como su mismo título lo, lo dice o lo indica, verdad, de forma activa en la realización de la actividad, so we have the next one, you can get a repair shop to fix your bike, you can get a repair shop to fix your bike, so here we're not being so specific, but we are mentioning that a repair shop can fix this person's bike. So here, once again, the repair shop is going to be active and they're going to uh, be hands-on when it comes to fixing the bike. Now, here, these two verbs are interchangeable. You can use, for example, you can get Hazel personal services, fix your bike. Or you can have a repair shop fix your bike. There's not going to be a huge different difference on which verb you use. The only thing is that, uh, for example, when you say you can have someone do something, it's a more polite way of saying it. But when you use get, it's more like um, like if you were the boss. Okay, like let's say in in the case of a company. Um, if the boss says, I will have my employees help me clean, 
That is a little bit better or sounds a little bit better than saying, I will get my employees to help me clean. Because get is more like um like if you're ordering it, like if uh it's an order and it's undisputable, but have is more like when you're gonna ask for it. Okay, so have sounds more like a favor and get is more like an obligation. Then we have the passive voice. When we use the passive voice, what matters the most is the activity being done, not who is carrying away the activity, but the activity itself. Esa es la parte importante, ¿verdad? Les decía antes, cuando utilizamos la voz activa, estamos tratando de mencionar de forma directa quién realizará la actividad. Entonces, y por eso es que se conoce como la voz activa, porque estamos eh, mencionando, ¿verdad? De forma directa a la persona que va a realizar la actividad. En cambio, cuando utilizamos la voz pasiva, lo que más nos interesa es la actividad que se realizará y no necesariamente quién la va a realizar. Claro, se menciona, porque sí se menciona, pero no es el punto focal de la oración. Entonces, ¿cómo sonaría el ejemplo en voz pasiva? Do you know where I can have my bike fixed? Do you know where I can have my bike fixed? So here I don't mind too much about who, but I mind about the activity. I mind about the bike fixing. Not who is going to fix it. I don't need to know someone. I need to know where. Okay. I need to know the where, not the who. Now, the examples that we have. You can have your bike fixed by Hazel's personal services. So it's the same thing. It's the same words, basically. But here, what we're doing is that we are first mentioning the activity. Okay, so first we refer to the bikes being, the bike, sorry, being fixed. Now, afterwards, we mention who is going to do the job. Here, we simply mention the who just to make a, or establish a clear idea of the activity that is going to be created away. So, um, you can have your bike fixed by Hazel's personal services. This means that um, this right here is going to be the important thing, all right? That the bike is fixed, not who, but the fact that it is done. And the other example is going to sound something like you can get your bike fixed at a repair shop. You can get your bike fixed at a repair shop. Y el mismo caso aplica, ¿verdad? O sea, si ustedes, por ejemplo, intercambian aquí el hub por el get, lo único que va a hacer es que va a funcionar un poco más eh, fuerte, va a sonar un poco más fuerte la frase que utilicemos cuando tengamos el get como el verbo principal. En cambio, si utilizamos el have, suena un poco más, ¿verdad? Como, o sea, con amabilidad, como si es algo que pues nosotros estamos, sabemos que vamos a pagar por aquello y así. En cambio, en get es casi como si se lo vamos a pedir a un empleado o a un familiar, digamos, alguien a quien probablemente no vayamos a tener que pagarle o no le vamos a pagar por esta actividad. Um, por ejemplo, o oraciones en las cuales no suena tan mal que se utilice el get, ¿verdad? Es como les decía antes, si ustedes son el jefe y pues, o sea, quieren presentar en alguna medida su autoridad sobre las personas, you can use get with no problem. Or if you're parents, if you have uh, children, you can also use get, you know, to 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 describe the activity that uh, you're going to ask your, t your children to do. So, yeah. But uh, I think for tonight, we're going to leave it at this. I don't know. Do, do you guys have any questions regarding the topics that we have been reviewing today? ¿Alguna duda que tengamos acerca de los temas que hemos estado tratando hoy? Bueno, tal parece que no, entonces. All right. So, for tonight, I think that's going to be it. Tomorrow, we're going to get to talk about the three word phrasal verbs because tonight we didn't have the time. But at least we got some vocabulary, okay? So, uh, hopefully, you guys were able to write some of that down or maybe get a screenshot of, of that vocabulary because it's very important. We are going to um, be needing it sometime. I can assure you guys. Because Islam words, even though they're not the most sophisticated, 
they are very useful. In today's world, to communicate and to understand with one another, we are going to be um, needing to know how to use these slang words. But well, for now, basically that's everything I had uh, for tonight. So thank you guys very much for your attention and participation in this evening's class. I hope you have an amazing night and I also hope I'll see you tomorrow again. So bye-bye for now and see you in the next one. Oh, wait. Uh, Bye. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, Bye. just one second. Solo voy a mostrar aquí la pantalla que quería que le viera la compañera. So there you have it. <laughs> Hope you get your screenshot. All right. So. Um, yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you guys very much. Have a really good one and see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye, teacher. Bye, teacher.